What is it like to come face to face with evil? To confront your worst nightmare? When a killer comes calling, there's often no escape. A man who can kill is evil beyond belief. To truly encounter evil is a rarity most will never experience. I believe in evil, uh, and I have experienced people that are evil. But for those unfortunate few who do and survive to tell the tale, the mental scars often never heal. I couldn't breathe. I was, my eyes felt bulging. All I could see was his face on my face, and he was just staring into my eyes. We meet the men and women whose lives have been forever altered by their brush with the beasts who live among us. This is Encounters with Evil. In this episode, ruthless, terrifying, and deadly, kidnap killers. When we're looking at offenders who take victims, keep them alive, ultimately kill them, society often views these as the most evil people that we have. Coming up, the perverted world of Ian Huntley, sexual predator, abductor and murderer of two 10-year-old girls. He didn't show the girls any dignity in death. The mysterious disappearance in the Australian outback of British tourist Peter Falconio. You can't even begin to imagine the fear that would have been going through Joanne's mind then. And a case the UK will never forget, the horrific kidnap and killing of toddler James Bulger. The act they committed can only be described in my mind as evil. But first, every mother's fear. The predatory paedophile who kidnaps and murders young girls at will. In 1990, in the Scottish village of Stowe, a man is spotted bundling a young girl into his van and driving off. Thanks to the quick reactions of a witness, the kidnapper is caught and the child saved. The man responsible, Robert Black, is perhaps one of Britain's most dangerous kidnap killers, a serial paedophile. He traveled the length and breadth of the UK and even Europe, preying on young girls. What he used to do was force the, the child in the back of the, of the van, tie them down, sexually assault them, rape them and then strangle them. Born in 1947 in Grangemouth, Scotland, Robert Black didn't have the easiest start in life. Robert Black was put out for adoption at a very early age. He did claim that he had been abused as a boy. He developed an absolute fascination with uh, female genitalia. And by his teenage years, he was already committing acts of sexual abuse. He first came to the attention of the police for a very serious incident where he uh, sexually assaulted a little girl of, of seven in a park in Greenock when he was 16, effectively leaving her for dead because he didn't just sexually assault her, he strangled her and left her unconscious. Black gets away with the assault and, in 1968, decides to move out of the area to London to find a job. He found work that gave him access to children. At first, he was a, a fantastic swimmer and he got work as a lifeguard. Whether or not he uh, abused his position, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly he would have enjoyed looking at the children. Then he found a job that would provide him with the perfect cover. 
he got a job as a van driver that took him all over the country. Delivering posters for rock concerts and all sorts of things, and the opportunity to go anywhere he wanted and to take anyone he wanted at any point. Nobody was telling him what to do. He could see children, he would pick up children. He was opportunistic, but he was well planned. It was in July 1982, while on the road, that Black acted on his paedophilic urges. The first crimes that he committed, that we, he was finally brought to trial for, involved a girl called Susan Maxwell. She's walking home from tennis, playing tennis with her friend. Unfortunately for Susan Maxwell, she encounters Robert Black. It's impossible to say how long Black kept Susan Maxwell alive. He then sexually assaulted her, murdered her, and then disposed of the body more than 200 miles away in the Midlands. It was in Utoxeter, a very long way indeed from the Scottish border. Then, a year later, in July 1983, Black struck again. Caroline Hogg was snatched in Portobello, not far from Edinburgh. One of Black's fetishes was that he developed at a very young age a fascination with girls' swimsuits. Caroline Hogg had been at the Portobello swimming pool. Now, whether he'd been watching her at the swimming pool, whatever it was, at some point, quite soon after she left, Black abducted her. Again, it's impossible to say exactly how long he kept her alive. And she was found days later, again, in, in, in the Midlands, having been abducted, sexually assaulted, murdered, and left in an area where, you know, she would clearly be found, as Susan had the year before. Due to the distances involved between abduction and deposition sites, police profilers suspected a long-distance lorry or van driver. When Black struck again, his next abduction and assault was three years later, in March 1986. This time, it was near Leeds, in Morley. Sarah Jane Harper was 10. Again, she was walking on her own, and she was snatched. Sarah Harper's mum needed something from the corner shop, which was only maybe 150 yards away. And uh, Sarah went off to the, to the shop, and like Caroline and Susan, she never came back. She was also abducted, sexually assaulted, murdered. Was kept alive, I suspect, for quite a long time. She was thrown into the River Trent in Nottingham, where she was found by a passerby. Although the police suspected that the murders were linked, they didn't have a single witness to any of the abductions. Then, in April 1988, Black attempted to kidnap a girl in Nottingham. Theresa Thornhill remembers her encounter with evil. There was um, one leg in the van, uh, one arm in the van, and the other arm and leg was on the floor, actually trying to stop myself from getting into the van. I can smell the oily hands. I can picture his clothes he was wearing. It's just, it just never goes away. I knew then he was actually going to do something if he would have got me in that van. I feel like there's something missing in my life that is taken from me, and I just can't find what it is. It's just ruined my life. After putting up a struggle, Teresa manages to escape, and Black swiftly flees the scene. Police are unable to find any solid leads on the dangerous kidnap killer. I think that, you know, this was a, an investigation that was crying out for luck because, you know, you are talking about almost a faceless person picking children up. It wasn't until 1990 that Black finally made a mistake in a small town in Scotland called Stowe. Postmaster, I think it was, was just out doing his garden, I think he was doing his edge. And he saw a blue van and he literally watched the legs of the child be lifted up. So he realised that there was an abduction taking place. As the witness called the police, Black sped off. Black was obviously in a very heightened 
stay. He was aroused, he'd been looking to do this for some time, and he headed south because he knew that there was a lay-by only about a mile and a half south of the village. And unfortunately, he sexually assaulted the girl in that lay-by, but he then wrapped her up again, and then he had to turn the van round and go back through Stow. Meanwhile, the witness was telling the police what he'd seen. The luck came in was at the point he was describing the van, he said, it's that van. The van was coming down the very road that they were in. This part makes my blood run cold, actually. The police officer was able to find the little girl in the van. It was actually his daughter. Remarkably, all he did was he said to Black, that's my daughter, you bastard. I think lots of other people with a uniform and a baton might have reacted in a different way. But that one piece of luck allowed the police to catch him bang the rights. Due to the similarities with the other kidnappings, it wasn't long before police connected the dots. Black was charged with the murders of Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg and Sarah Harper. There was absolutely no forensic or eyewitness evidence that linked Black to any of these crimes. It was entirely circumstantial. But there was one piece of evidence that was to be Black's downfall. Black was placed by his work records, and in particular his petrol receipts, within a mile or half a mile of the point of abduction, often very close in time as well, um, to all three abduction sites. He was also linked to the points of disposal by petrol receipts. That'd be uh, driving along and see a young girl. I'd go out and talk to her and try to persuade her to get in the van and uh, take her somewhere quiet. On the 19th of May, 1994, Robert Black was found guilty on all charges and received a life sentence for his horrendous crimes. While behind bars, Black was found guilty of a fourth murder, that of Jennifer Cardi in 1981. He was certainly remorseless. He was certainly psychopathic. He was certainly not interested in anything except his own gratification and he took enormous pleasure in sexual abuse. And all the time, there are other unexplained deaths, some of them in Europe, some of them in England, some of them in Scotland, which has always led me to believe that Black was the single most dangerous serial killer Britain has ever seen. Before his death in prison in 2016, Black was about to be charged with the murder of Jeanette Tate in 1978. Jeanette Tate's mother, Sheila Cook, put it to me very well when I spoke to her. She said that uh, she cried not just for the loss of uh, Jeanette, but for the, the life that she never had. And I think that's really what the families carry with them forever. Valentine's Day 1993 was a day of sorrow, not love, across the UK, when the body of a two-year-old boy was found on a railway track in Liverpool. The extent of his injuries indicated torture and a brutality that was beyond belief. It can only be described as one of the most horrific murders of a small boy that it's possible to imagine. To the nation's shock and bewilderment, it transpired that two 10-year-old boys were the primary suspects. Pathologists established he'd been beaten with bricks, stones and a piece of metal. What dreadful series of events had led to such a depraved killing? It was two days earlier, the 12th of February, that Denise Bulger was out at the Strand shopping centre in Bootle. Her two-year-old son, James, followed by her side. Denise had literally only gone into the butchers for probably 25 seconds 
But in those 25, 30 seconds, these two 10-year-olds abducted, there's no other word for it, Bulger from outside the butcher's shop and marched him quite speedily out of the shopping centre and away from where his mother would be able to find him. And we see the classic TV shot where he's in the middle and the two boys are walking him out. And nobody would actually query that. It's two brothers with their kid brother. Once the boys had lured James from his mother, they led him by the hand out of the shopping centre. They were challenged by uh, two or three adults. I think um, young James was actually crying, and so people actually were asking, well, what's that? And they, they seemed to have a, a plan response, we're taking him home. But they said, oh, no, we, we're taking him home, he's our brother which I always think is a very clear indication that they knew exactly what they were planning to do. They decided that they were going to kidnap and murder a child. They went to the shopping centre with that in mind. The closed circuit television is pretty clear. They were actually searching for a, a small boy. The two abductors, Robert Thompson and John Venables, then led James on a walk around the local area. They ended up walking quite a long way. Um, I think it was something like four kilometres. 38 people had seen these two boys with this two-year-old boy. Eventually, the boys reached a secluded stretch of railway. Now alone and out of sight, Thompson and Venables proceeded to torture two-year-old James. Part of it was throwing a tin of paint which they'd stolen earlier in the day in the shopping mall into the boy's eye. Thompson started kicking the boy very violently because there were marks, very severe marks on Bulger's body. Venables participated too. The violence went on and on in an effort to conceal the crime, these two 10-year-old boys laid the by now dead James Bulger on a railway track and his body was cut in half by a train. James's body was discovered two days later, on the 14th of February. There was horrendous physical damage to James. There's no question about it. And having talked to Jimmy, his uncle, who had to identify him. Jimmy was horrified and has never really ever got over the shock of seeing what happened. The police said it was one of the most distressing scenes they'd ever encountered. For the person who found him, it must have been a, a dreadful traumatic experience and one that I doubt if they'll, they'll forget. James Bulger's murder shocked the world. The grainy images of him hand in hand with two anonymous boys being led away from his mother appeared across TV and newspapers globally. The police were now in the spotlight to identify the kidnappers. Somewhere in the region of about 30 to 40 other children were arrested, interviewed and very quickly discharged. And how Thompson and Venables got um, selected was because the, of the pictures and when they were in, enhanced by special technology, a woman recognised them and said, oh, this is uh, Thompson and Venables, and they got picked up by the police. The police began their questioning of Thompson and Venables. The key breakthrough was when John Venables asked if he could get fingerprints off skin. He, uh, on his arrival at the police station, he'd given his fingerprints. It was obviously playing on his mind as the questions were we're progressing through the interviews. When a child asks you that, there's something to it, and you're only asking for one reason. By uh, questioning them separately and then revealing to the other what the other had said, they were able to get claim and counterclaim, and that was gradually how they broke them down. I think Robert Thompson um, was more forthcoming, he, he, he admitted first of all that they had taken him and then investigators were able to use that against Venables who had completely denied it. Why haven't 
I take flowers over to the baby to put all the other I stuff I don't know. It's up to you. If I kill them. Well, you were there. Why did you take flowers? You knew, you knew who did it, didn't you? Yeah. Who? John. Because John hit him in the face. So there was a lot of kind of blaming each other, which was understandable in a way, and very childlike behaviour. And then he hit him again. Well, There's we... like a big metal thing. What was Robert saying while he was doing all this? He was saying, stay down, you stupid dick and all that. Why did he want him to stay down? I don't know. He wanted him dead, probably. He mimicked what James said, saying that he wanted his mum. And he actually says, I want my mum, and actually gave a sort of a, a voice like a three-year-old boy. And you said the bar knocked him out? Yeah. Onto the railway track. And what happened then? No, he was just lying there. To finish now, because I can't speak anymore. Gradually, with the help of the social services and managed to get the, the story of what had happened unfolded in front of the police and eventually they were able to deliver that evidence to the court. Forensic evidence collected from the scene and the suspect's homes confirmed that they were responsible for James's kidnap and murder. Among the evidence they have collected was the brick that at one point Thompson and Venables had used to batter Bulger's head and it still had Bulger's blood on it just as the boots that they were wearing were matched to the marks on the poor boy's body. On the 20th of February, eight days after their horrendous crime, the two 10-year-olds were charged. The trial of Thompson and Venables took place at Preston Crown Court nine months later. The boys said nothing at all during their trial. The only time they talked about the crime was in the police interviews. And so it was those interviews, along with the forensic evidence, that led to their conviction. I think they were just overwhelmed by the whole experience. Thompson seemed to be almost disinterested, but you don't know whether they were in shock, whether it was just everything was overwhelming, or whether they didn't really care. Earlier, child psychologists who've examined A and B were called to testify about the boy's mental capabilities. The prosecution has to show that they knew right from wrong. 37 witnesses gave testimony that they had seen the two boys with James as they walked him to his death. There was no doubt the boys were guilty, but how should such young offenders be punished? British justice is not equipped to hand out sentences to 10-year-old boys for murder. So whatever sentence the two boys were given was probably going to be wrong. They were originally given eight years, taking them to 18. The judge's sentence was criticised by many who were of the opinion that the two boys should be locked up indefinitely for their heinous crime. I don't think they should just stay eight years. I think they should do a lot longer than that. For what they've done to our baby, they shouldn't be level adults life, I think. I could imagine they were so angry and they would have wanted, you know, the worst form of punishment, and I can understand that totally, but I think if we are a civilised society, we must always try to do what's correct. The argument surely must be that still very young, very inexperienced life, we had to rehabilitate them. Thompson and Venables were released in 2001 at the age of 18. In my view, they were wicked separately, but evil together. That the act they committed can only be described in my mind as evil. Were they born evil? No. Did they do something that was horrendous outside of our normal perception of right and wrong? Yes, with no question. The killers featured in this episode represent some of the most sinister cases of kidnap killers. But what makes them so terrifying? Society often views these people as the most evil that we have. It's the notion of keeping someone against their will when they may be missing their mum or their dad or their family. And I think everybody can kind of imagine 
a little bit what it must be like for themselves if they were in that situation. And I think that's why we find it such an evil act. On the night of the 14th of July, 2001, British tourists Joanne Lees and Peter Falconio were traveling a remote road in the Australian outback. They were pulled over by a strange man who attempted to kidnap Joanne. She escaped, but Peter was never seen again. It's January 2001. 27-year-old Joanne Lees and 28-year-old Peter Falconio are on the last leg of a round-the-world trip. They're living and working in Sydney. Peter and Joanne had been like a lot of young people. They'd wanted to go on a world tour, they'd wanted to travel, and they were doing that together. They'd spent about six months in Sydney working, but enjoying the Sydney lifestyle. They wanted to explore more of Australia's vast wilderness so hit the road in a camper van. And by July, Joanne and Peter had made it to Alice Springs in the country's Northern Territory. It was a small town, it's quiet, so they didn't spend too long there and they then head out into the, into the open bush. On the 14th of July, Joanne and Peter set out for the next leg of their road trip. We know that on the day that Peter and Joanne left Alice, they were just doing the ordinary things. Stopped off at a cafe to eat at Tea Tree. They had some cannabis, you know, they were being free, they were traveling. With Peter at the wheel, the couple drive the quiet road without encountering another vehicle. They'd been driving for a while and they noticed uh, lights quite close to them behind in the mirror. Peter slowed down thinking that the car would overtake them, but it didn't the car was flashing them to stop and pointing at their exhaust. So Peter pulled over after a discussion about whether it was safe to pull over or not. And the thing about being a traveler is you automatically trust. You know, everybody trusts when they're traveling. So Peter and Joanne pull the vehicle over. Peter gets out to talk to the guy who's suggesting something's wrong with the van. Suddenly, Joanne hears a loud bang, which she thought was the exhaust backfiring. Uh, the next thing she knew, there was a man standing at the side of the car with a gun aimed at her. At this point, she was uh, shouting for Peter. She didn't know where Peter was. Her uh, hands were tied behind her back. She was made to get out of the car. The man attempted to also bind her ankles, but she fought with him. The assailant proceeded to bundle Joanne into the back of his truck. She realizes that she's in absolute danger and she knows that she has to get out. Joanne actually manages to push herself out of the side of the vehicle, which is made of fabric. Joanne runs away from the road into the darkness eventually stopping to hide among the scrub of the outback. She manages to find some undergrowth and she knows that she has to stay there to save her life because she can hear him searching for her. She stays there for hours, completely terrified, knowing that potentially Peter is dead. I can't even begin to imagine the fear that would have been going through Joanne's mind then. Joanne lies, silent and still, for five hours. She manages to actually get the cable ties around the front so she actually can run. She's free, essentially. She has her hands in front of her. She finally gathers the courage to flag down a lorry driver who takes her to safety. But what had become of Peter? As far as I'm concerned, the attacker had one very clear intention. He wants to rape and potentially murder Joanne. She's what he's after. So he kills Peter because he's in the way. He shot Peter immediately. That's the first thing he did. He got him out of the car, shot him, and then came round to see Joanne. 
The disappearance of Peter Falconio led to one of the biggest investigations in Australian police history. Blood on the road, but no sign of him. Mr Falconio's body has never been found. Police quickly discover the camper van, but there was no sign of Peter's whereabouts. The story was worldwide news, Joanne the focus of a media scrum. The press, hungry for answers. This is a young woman who's just been in a situation where she believes her partner has been murdered brutally, where she was literally about to be kidnapped and possibly murdered herself. And suddenly, every media outlet wants to hear her story. 11 days after the incident, Joanne made her statement to the press, who had already printed the idea that she was making the story up and that she had killed Peter. She seemed in the initial interviews somewhat detached. I think it made people question what the true account was. People imagined that she had premeditated the murder, which was completely incorrect, but nonetheless took the scent off the actual killer for a long period of time. Then over three weeks later, the forensic results arrive, suggesting that Joanne is telling the truth. One of the biggest pieces of evidence was that Joanne's T-shirt, there was a spot of blood and they found another person's DNA that wasn't hers and it wasn't Peter's. They also found it on the gear stick and they found it on the tethers. Now, the fact that that belonged to another human being that wasn't Peter meant that there was somebody else involved. However, the identity of the third man and the location of Peter Falconio remained a mystery. Almost a year passed before the police got their break in the case. A man was arrested in South Australia for a similar crime that fitted Joanne's account of her attempted kidnap. At the time of the investigation of the disappearance of Peter, Bradley Murdoch is on trial in southern Australia for an abduction and rape. The DNA on Joanne's T-shirt matches the DNA evidence that they now have for Bradley Murdoch. So they are then obviously tying him to the disappearance of Peter. When they discovered what he had on him, they were tethers that were very similar to what he tethered Joanne with. He was somebody that kind of sparked their interest. He lived in the outback. He liked to consider himself a tough guy. He fitted the profile of somebody that was a kind of dropout in many ways, that was an antisocial person. With the strength of DNA evidence, the Northern Territory Police arrest Murdoch. They also have CCTV images that pin him to the locale. Joanne had given a quite detailed description of a man with a beard and scruffy hair and his build, and CCTV evidence emerged of a man fitting that description almost identically in a service station in Alice Springs on the same night. The reason that the police could charge Murdoch, even though they didn't have a body, was because the chain of events, the evidence given by Joanne, the blood, the car, all created a fit. And even though they didn't have a body, the weight of evidence, the chain of causation, was so powerful that it created a conviction. Bradley Murdoch was found guilty for the murder of Peter Falconio and the attempted abduction of Joanne Lees and sentenced to life in prison. I absolutely believe that Murdoch killed Falconio. The problem is that because there wasn't a body, it's led to huge conspiracy theories, and people still believe that Joanne was involved in his death. Sadly, to this day, Peter's body remains missing, and Bradley Murdoch seems adamant that he will take the secret of its location to his grave. One of the most evil aspects of this case and is the fact that Murdoch doesn't allow the family that closure of knowing where Peter's body is, to give them that ongoing torture of never being able to lay that loved one to rest. That's almost the ultimate act of, of evil, really. The other victim in this crime is always the forgotten one, which is Joanne. She was painted out to be a potential murderess, and that's something that will have affected and shaped her life.
On the 17th of August, 2002, the remains of two 10-year-old schoolgirls were discovered in the Suffolk countryside. The brutality of these murders shocked the nation and put the village of Soham on the map. This public display of grief appears unending as hundreds continue to pass through this small Cambridgeshire town to pay their respects. But what had happened? to Holly and Jessica. On the 4th of August, 2002, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman had left a family barbecue to visit a tuck shop in the quiet village of Soham. But then, they mysteriously vanished. Two families pleaded for help in finding their missing daughters. A whole town, it seemed, turned out in response. This evening, there were countless volunteers assembled outside the girls' school, waiting to be organized by the police into small search units. As the full-scale police search for the girls began, local school caretaker Ian Huntley seemed very eager to help. He was kind of butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, and yet there was something about him. It was as if you couldn't quite see what was going on in his eyes. Police questioned Huntley who openly admitted the girls had visited his house that day. My image of, of Ian Huntley was that he was very narcissistic, he was very much into himself, he wanted to be the star of the show, and he seemed to want the attention. Huntley claimed that the girls had come to visit his partner, Maxine Carr, who was a teaching assistant at their school. Carr corroborated his story. She started talking about how nice the girls were and how she interacted with them and everything else. She was trying to show that she was um, close to the girls and knew about them and everything else. Again, attention-seeking. Their disappearance is incredibly out of character. They haven't been missing before. Very well balanced, very bright young girls. As far as we can tell, they've taken no change of clothing and no money. Huntley claimed that he had been the last person to see the girls before they vanished. I've always felt that was more about laying false trails and trying to put the police off the scent. In his interviews with the press, Huntley appeared regretful that he couldn't be more helpful. I keep reliving that conversation and thinking perhaps something different could have been said. Perhaps kept them here a little bit longer and maybe changed events. But behind Huntley's facade of normality and apparent concern lay a sinister character with a history of violence and abuse. He had quite a sexual history in the sense of being involved in, in lots of deviant sex. He was quite violent in the past. Huntley is someone who has a history of controlling and coercion of partners, specifically Maxine, but others as well. Huntley's ex-girlfriend, Rebecca Bartlett, remembers his controlling and violent nature. When he was telling me to do things I used to do because I was scared. And I thought I was pregnant to him, and he, like, punched me in the stomach. So, I, like, I went flying on the bed, and then that's when I thought to myself I shouldn't be there. Although his violent history was unknown to the police, Huntley was taken in for questioning, along with Carr. No, I think that was probably, you know, it's a very good detective work. Certainly, in some, a couple of things Maxine Carr said, I think that police started to notice, well, hang on, you know, you're talking with perhaps a, a, a greater degree of knowledge than you should have. Acting on their suspicions, the police conducted a search of Huntley's home and storage unit. While Huntley and Carr were being separately interviewed, the police revealed that they'd found significant evidence, which turned out to be the football jerseys of Holly and Jessica that Huntley had tried to destroy and put into a storage unit. Based on the scorched remains of the girls' clothes, the police arrested Huntley and Carr. His house, which goes with the job, is currently being searched, as is the college and the girls' school, where his partner, Maxine Carr, was a classroom assistant. Then, on the 17th of August, 2002, 
the bodies of Holly and Jessica were discovered by a dog walker in the nearby countryside. When the bodies were eventually found about 11 days later, they had been burned and they were decomposed. They, in fact, were properly identified by the dental records. Crucially, evidence from Huntley's red Ford Fiesta revealed that he had recently driven down the path next to the deposition site. Forensics had also found Huntley's hairs on the girl's burned clothing. And so he was charged with the murder of Holly and Jessica. At his trial, Huntley continued to lie about what had happened. He was performing in court, trying to deny it, trying to blame other people. He was not taking any responsibility at all. And I think that was a, indicative of its whole behavior, this lack of any um, guilt at all of what he'd done. Eventually, Huntley broke down and admitted that he had killed the girls, but that it was all an accident. He gave all sorts of extraordinary descriptions about one having a nosebleed, one falling into the bath she drowned before he noticed, and then the other one was screaming, and he had to stop her screaming. But in reality, the double murder was no accident. I think probably the killing did pl take place in the bathroom. Certainly, there's no doubt that he didn't want them screaming, so I suspect it was quite rapid. I think he lost his temper. I think it was a crime of opportunity and crime of rage. After dumping the girls' bodies, it's thought that Huntley returned to the deposition site and attempted to burn them. He didn't show the girls any dignity in death. He literally threw them out, and that he was willing to, to burn them, to hide evidence, to save himself, clearly speaks volumes about his character. That is really quite a brutal act to do, to try and burn the body of young, young children like that. And it clearly shows that he was, had no sense of remorse, no guilt at all. Very psychopathic in his lack of any awareness of what the impact was on the family. It also emerged that on the day Huntley committed the murders, Carr wasn't at the house. She was in Grimsby. Huntley had had a conversation with her on the telephone that afternoon in which he'd accused her of cheating on him. I think that was the inciting incident. I think that that's what sent Huntley over the edge. It was after that phone call to Carr that he saw Jessica and Holly outside the house where he lived. He told the girls that Maxine was in the house and that they could go in and see her. So that clearly was a deliberate lie that he told. He wanted to get Jessica and Holly into the house in private. It's been suggested that perhaps he attacked them in a spontaneous fit of rage because he was so angry, but perhaps he'd also been fantasizing about doing something like this for a long period of time. And given the instability of his mind, he decided now was the time to act. Ian Huntley says he accepts responsibility for the deaths of Holly and Jessica, but he says, there's nothing I can do about it now. I sincerely wish there was. This from the same caretaker on day 20 of his trial for double murder the day he went into the witness box and said he was sorry for what had happened. As he left the courthouse afterwards in a police convoy, the crowd outside had grown bigger and more vocal. On the 17th of December, 2003, Ian Huntley was convicted of two counts of murder, for which he received two life sentences. His girlfriend, Maxine Carr, received 21 months for providing a false alibi. Huntley is currently being held at Frankland High Security Prison. There can be no doubt in my mind that Huntley really enjoyed the notoriety. He liked being a focus of attention and he loved being interviewed. It also underlines his utter lack of remorse. If you'd taken the life of two small girls, would you not be tormented by guilt? I think most normal people would be, but Huntley certainly wasn't. <laughs>